Hello everybody, my name is Wolfgang Brill and this video is about the use of phosphorodithiolate internucleotidic linkages and their ability to render nucleic acids of becoming pharmaceuticals. To begin with, a couple of words on the general setup of nucleic acids. This slide shows a substructure of DNA on the left and RNA on the right. Polynucleotides like DNA and RNA are composed of various subunits called nucleotides, which are interconnected by internucleotidic linkages. In natural nucleic acids, these are phosphodiesters. The other components of the nucleic acids are the carbohydrates, which form together with the internucleotidic linkage, the backbone. Finally, they are the nucleotide bases. They form among each other hydrogen bonding arrays as shown here in case of Watson-Crick base pairing. By doing so, they create large hydrophobic environments, which can stack upon one another as seen here in case of DNA. Also in case of RNA, stacking between various nucleotide bases creates large hydrophobic environments, which stabilizes the structure of the nucleic acid upon hydrophobic collapse. Nucleotide bases are also involved in the interactions of nucleic acids with proteins. As we can see here in the crystal structure of human IgG aptomer complex, only a small part of the nucleic acid is interacting with the protein. In fact, certain hydrophobic base residues of the nucleic acid are interacting with hydrophobic parts on the protein surface. In turn, the highly negatively charged nucleic acid backbone remains outside the protein aptomer interface. This raises the question of whether the internucleotidic linkages could be made to bind to proteins as well, which would lead to nucleic acids with much greater affinity to proteins. In the 1980s, during my PhD thesis with Marvin Carruthers at the University of Colorado in Boulder, I proposed to gain access to oligonucleotide phosphorodithiolates. Originally, to gain greater nuclease stability for antisense molecules. At that time, of course, I didn't have any idea about ongoing activities towards the same direction in other labs. However, we succeeded making these compounds. They are achiral, like phosphodiesters, isoelectronic with phosphodiesters, and have a similar charge distribution as the parent phosphodiesters. However, they are much less hydrated than the parent phosphodiesters. In fact, they show a greater ability to interact with hydrophobic residues, such as electron-poor, aromatics, or alkylating agents. They also interact with poorly hydrated cations, like lysine side chains, to minimize the exposure of poorly hydrated surfaces to water. This, of course, has a great impact on improving the interactions of polynucleotides with protein targets. Here are a couple of examples on the recent literature on the impact on phosphodiethylates. Wu et al. have presented in their Nature Communication paper from 2014 how the effect of SI RNAs can dramatically be enhanced upon replacement of phosphodiesters by phosphodiethylate residues. They have shown that their SI RNA has an enhanced anti-tumoral activity in mouse models, particularly in presence of a combination drug Paclitaxel. The authors attribute this greater activity to the greater affinity of the dithiolate bearing SIRNA 
to the RNA silencing complex risk. The computer model is shown on this slide. On the left, they show their model of the unmodified siRNA interacting with the protein. On the right, there is a model of the dathoate portion of their dathoate modified siRNA interacting with the protein. The authors believe that additional interactions imposed by the dathoate group to hydrophobic residues in the protein cleft might attribute to the greater affinity. Another aspect is the enhanced intracellular stability of modified siRNA molecules. This slide shows the stability curves of the 2 prime methylated siRNA bearing 2 dathoate residues in red compared to the stability curve of the siRNA bearing natural nucleotides in black. At this moment, a few words on the stability of nucleic acids in biological fluids. Nucleic acids are being hydrolyzed by enzymes called nucleases, which cleave the phosphodiester bond. The problem in this reaction is the negative charge of the phosphodiester, which obscures the interaction with a equally negatively charged nucleophile. To overcompensate that, nucleases make use of the interaction of a phosphodiester with a Lewis acid. This neutralizes the negative charge on the phosphodiester and renders the phosphorus prone for a nucleophilic attack. Not all Lewis acids work equally well as co-catalysts for nuclease digest. Generally, hard Lewis acids like calcium and magnesium are most commonly encountered as co-catalysts. The interaction of chiral phosphorthoate bearing internucleotidic linkages with nucleases reveals also that the phosphoryl oxygen of the internucleotidic linkage must interact with the protein-bound Lewis acid. When such a chiral phosphorothoate is fixed in such a way to the protein that the sulfur residue comes close to the protein-bound Lewis acid, no hydrolysis is observed. These findings prompted me to propose the phosphorodithoate residue as internucleotidic linkage in the middle 1980s. It was assumed that the two soft basic residues of the dithoate linkage would not allow a activation of the internucleotidic linkage with the generally found hard Lewis acids like calcium and magnesium in nucleases. As anticipated, phosphodithoate internucleotidic linkages are stable to nuclease digest. There are structural differences between nucleic acids with phosphodiester backbone and those bearing phosphodithoates. DNA with a fully dithoate modified backbone has a lower melting point than the parent DNA with the same sequence. The reason lies in the lower hydration of the dithoate backbone exposed to the solvent. This reduces the stability of the double helix. In RNA analogs, single phosphodithoate modifications stabilize stem loop structures. The so stabilized hairpins are known to interact well with protein targets. Exactly this was exploited by Abidira et al. in their paper published in Nucleic Acid Research in 2016. They were using a single dithoate modification 
to optimize binding to thrombin. They did that by a dithiolate walk along the aptomer sequence as shown on this slide. By doing so, they obtained an aptomer with picomolar binding to the thrombin target. Also here, as in the case of the earlier shown siRNA, the increase of affinity of the nucleic acid with the protein target is attributed to the interaction of the dithiolate backbone modification with hydrophobic residues on the protein surface. X-ray structure of this aptomer thrombin complex indicates that there might be an interaction even with a phenyl residue of the protein. In contrast, X-ray structure of the unmodified aptomer does not show such interaction. But how are phosphorodithioid synthesized? In the next few slides, I would like to talk about a methodology that I originally designed during my PhD thesis in the 1980s and which is very much similar to the methodology used to make normal phosphodiesters. The advantage of that methodology is the use of commercially available starting materials, the so-called phosphorothioamidides. The synthesis of oligonucleotide phosphorodithioates begins with a nucleoside or polynucleotide which is completely protected at its basis and its phosphodiesters or phosphodiester analog and bound by its 3' hydroxy to a polymeric support via an ester linkage. This molecule bears a 5' dimethoxy triadyl group, which is an acid labeled protective group which can be replaced upon treatment with dilute trifluoracetic acid. Subsequent coupling with a thioamidide with the now liberated 5' hydroxy function on the polymeric support is performed. This reaction is catalyzed by tetrazole, which acts both as a weak acid activating the phosphorothioamidide or as a nucleophile enhancing the rate of the substitution reaction on the phosphorus. The result of this reaction is a thiophosphite. These thiophosphites are very labile to oxygen and therefore the solvents used in the synthesis cycles have to be kept oxygen free. The thiophosphites now bound on the polymeric support are now being oxidized with a sulfur transfer reagent. Very often Bocage reagent is used for this purpose. But also elemental sulfur in appropriate solvents had been employed successfully. Reactions that had not been completed are then being capped upon acetylations. That prevents an accumulation of failure sequences in the final product. After the coupling cycle is completed, we have a oligonucleotide chain or dinucleotide bound to the polymeric support bearing a 5' dimethoxytriadyl group. The next synthesis cycle may now commence upon detriolation of the 5' dimethoxy triadyl group. Alternatively, when the synthesis is complete, the protective groups on the nucleotide basis and on the internucleotidic linkages may be cleaved upon treatment with ammonia. The oligonucleotide that only bears its 5' dimethoxytriadyl group is liberated from the polymeric support in this step. 
the hydrophobicity induced by the 5' prime protective group allows purification from failure sequences that do not bear such a functionality. This slide shows the difference of the building block for the phosphodithioate internucleotidic linkage, the phosphorothioamidite, on the left compared with the building block of regular phosphodiesters, the phosphoramidides on the right. As you may note, there is a difference with the amino function that is being displaced in the coupling, highlighted in red, and the protective group, which is introduced through the thioamidite and will be later cleaved with ammonia, giving the free dithioate internucleotidic linkage. Unfortunately, a more complicated uh, protective group had been employed since cyanomercaptoethanol, as shown in the middle of the left part of this slide, is an extremely unstable compound that cannot be used during the synthesis. The cleavage of the protective group in the thioamidite synthesis is shown in the bottom left of that slide. We also try to employ uh, benzyl functionalities bearing electron withdrawing groups. However, their cleavage is not as clean and requires the inconveniently smelling thiophenol for the protection. The reason why thioamidides are different from phosphoamidides lies in the kinetic of the coupling reaction seen on the top of this slide. As you may see, the reaction of a thioamidide giving a thiophosphite is directly determined by the basicity of the amine leaving group. The more basic the amine, the more rapid the coupling reaction. The coupling rate is also determined by the steric bulk of the amine leaving group. The greater the bulk imposed by the amine leaving group, the lower the reaction rate. Consequently, the least bulky and most basic functionality, the pyrrolidine, results in the highest coupling rates. When one wants to obtain thioamidides, one has to consider their enhanced ability to acid, to oxygen, and to the fact that they cannot be chromatographed. Thus, a methodology must be devised to give them in form pure enough to be used in the oligonucleotide synthesis. This slide shows this methodology that begins with the disproportionation of phosphorus trichloride with dipyrrolidyl phosphine, giving chlorodipyrrolidyl phosphine. The chlorophosphine is stable to excess of non-nucleophilic base like triethylamine present in this reaction mixture. However, it can react readily with a nucleophile such as the 3' hydroxy function of a nucleoside, giving a nucleoside phosphorobispyrrolidite. The latter is not isolated in this process. It is, in fact, extremely labeled to even trace amounts of acid. It has to be noted that one equivalent of triethyl ammonium chloride has also been formed in this process. Though this compound is acidic, its acidity is neutralized by the vast excess of triethyl amine. In the next step of this one-pot procedure, the thiol, which constitutes the protective group of the dithioate linkage for the oligonucleotide synthesis, is added to the reaction mixture. 
then the volatile ingredients of the reaction mixture, meaning the solvent and excess triethylamine, are being removed. Consequently, the acidity of the reaction mixture is increased as the concentration of the non-volatile ammonium halides in the reaction mixture is increasing. These ammonium halides catalyze the substitution of one of the pyrrolidyl groups on the bisperolidyl amidite by the thiol giving the thioamidite. As you may see, on the NMR spectrum, on the lower right of the slide, the phosphorothioamidite is obtained in a pure form and can be easily used for the oligonucleotide synthesis after uh, aqueous workup and precipitation. At this point, I would like to conclude my presentation of phosphorodite. Nucleic acids, very specific phosphorodithioid residues, bind better to protein targets than nucleic acids with naturally occurring phosphodiesters. This has a profound impact on the utilizability of such modified nucleic acids as aptamers and silencing RNAs. In fact, picomolar binding of oligonucleotide aptamers bearing specific phosphorodithioid residues has been achieved. This renders them competitive with small molecular weight drugs, considering the free binding enthalpy uh, per mass unit of the drug. How can this be achieved? Well, dithioid residues allow greater hydrophobic interactions of the oligonucleotide backbone with a protein target. This leads to a potentially greater uh, interface between nucleic acids and proteins, which of course is responsible for the greater binding. Phosphorodithioids also stabilize hairpins and bulges, which are structures that lead to the exposure of hydrophobic bases, which then allow them to interact with hydrophobic clefts of the protein target. Thirdly, there is a greater nuclease resistance imposed by dithioids. And the synthesis of oligonucleotides bearing dithioid residues is very similar to the commonly used phosphide triester method. In fact, a oligonucleotide bearing one or several phosphorodithioid residues could be synthesized on a commercial oligonucleotide synthesizer, so only by adding a couple of more reagents. There may, of course, be applications of oligonucleotides bearing phosphorodithioids outside life science, in areas like catalysis, nanoelectronics, or performance materials. This is likely due to the ability of the dithioid residues to interact with transition metals. There may be one day an oligonucleotide with several dithioid residues acting as a molecular cast for a metallic nanostructure. But this is future. There's lots to do and I leave it to your creativity. Thank you very much for your attention. Goodbye.